Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys are all doing super, super well. Today we're gonna be talking about what happened to two-year-old Tika Lewis. This case occurred in Tacoma, Washington, and it really just makes you realize that anything can happen in a matter of seconds. You can turn away from your child for five, 10 seconds, and in those quick moments, your child could be gone. This case happened over 20 years ago, but it's definitely important to keep sharing Tika's story, keep sharing her name, and continue to spread awareness. So yeah, that's pretty much what we're gonna be talking about in today's video. Thank you guys so much for being here and listening to Tika's story. I truly appreciate all the support that you guys show to this channel. If you guys are new, welcome. Hopefully you guys can join the familia by clicking the subscribe button down below. If you guys ever want to hear a recap of my videos, you guys can head over to my true crime TikTok account. It's called True Crime Jackie and it'll be linked down below. But yeah, I think that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you guys again so much for being here and let's jump right into Tika's case. Tika Lewis was born on July 4th, 1996. She was born to parents Teresa and Robert and lived in Tacoma, Washington. Tika is described as having a quiet and shy personality. She was definitely a mama's girl. She loved being with her mom and would cry if anyone else would try to pick her up. If her siblings, uncles, aunts, grandparents, anyone else carried her, she would immediately cry and want to go back to her mom. That's how close their relationship was. She slept with her mother and always had to have her blankie with her. I believe Tika was one of five children and she had a younger sister named Tamika who she absolutely loved. Teresa says that every single morning, Tika would wake up and tell her mom she wanted some cereal, which was her favorite breakfast meal. So she would wake up, go get her cereal, and then she would rush over to the TV and turn on Winnie the Pooh. She absolutely loved this show and had so many Winnie the Pooh stuffed animals. Another one of her favorite foods was french fries. Teresa says that anytime they would pass McDonald's and Tika would see the golden arches, she would immediately shout out french fries and then they would pull over and get some. She also really loved eating candy and her favorite brand were Starburst. Tika was a shy little girl, but she was also very joyful. She smiled a lot and was just an overall happy toddler. Fast forward to Saturday, January 23rd, 1999. Over a dozen members of Tika's family headed over to the New Frontier bowling lane in Tacoma, Washington. On this particular night, the bowling alley was extremely busy. It was league night, so there were over 300 people at this bowling alley. Tika's family was placed in the center, and they took up lanes 7 and 8. Since a big group of Tika's family was there, there were a lot of kids running around all over the place. So in order to make sure that they were all watching the kids, anytime a family member would take their turn to bowl, the rest of the family members that were sitting down would watch over the kids, and that's how they would help each other out. Now, most of the family members stayed near the bowling lanes, but Tika was particularly interested in the arcade. That's where she wanted to hang out for the night, so Teresa was following her daughter around as she checked out the various games, and then she would go back to the bowling lanes to be with the rest of the family. At one point, Tika was drawn to a claw game, and she tried to win one of the stuffed animals, but since she was so tiny, her uncle had to come over and help her win. She ended up winning a teddy bear and gave it to her younger sister. Tika just really loved the arcade that night, so she would go back multiple times and use some coins that she had in her purse to play the games. Now, based on some reports, lanes 7 and 8 were somewhat close to the arcade, so while Tika's family was bowling, they were able to glance back and check on Tika. At around 10.15, 10.30, Tika sat down in the driver's seat of the Cruisin' World game and began to play. As I mentioned earlier, Teresa was following her daughter around the arcade just to make sure she was okay. So she was with Tika when she sat down to play the driving game and she told her to just stay put while she quickly glanced over at her family. She just wanted to see how her brother's turn was going so she quickly looked away for around 10 to 15 seconds. That's it. She turned away for a couple of seconds and when she looked back, her daughter was gone. Teresa began checking the spaces between the games and the wall just in case Tika was playing hide and seek. 
She searched all over the arcade, shouting Tika's name, but she didn't find her. So then she headed over to the bathroom, just in case Tika went in there on her own. When she got inside the restroom, she saw one of her cousins in there changing her baby's diaper. So she asked her cousin, hey, have you seen Tika? But she said no. After this, Teresa ran out to the parking lot, shouting her daughter's name, looking between the cars, and she just didn't know what else to do. I cannot imagine what was going through her head at this moment. I'm not a parent, but I know that when a parent loses sight of their child, it is the worst feeling in the world. And you know, kids are so fast, so I feel like even if you just like turn away to look at your phone or to grab something from your purse, anything can happen and the kid could run off. So of course, Teresa is feeling very scared at this moment and she decides to go back inside the bowling alley and approaches an off-duty police officer. She tells a police officer everything that happened and he immediately begins to help search for Tika. The bowling alley also makes an announcement about Tika's disappearance and asks people to be on the lookout. But honestly, a lot of people didn't really seem to care. The majority of the people continued to bowl, they continued to play the arcade games, like they weren't really too helpful. But of course, Tika's family immediately stopped playing and they all branched out throughout the bowling alley and searched everywhere. They literally searched the bowling lanes, the arcade, the food area, the bathrooms, the parking lot. They even searched inside the employee offices, but there was just no sign of Tika. This is when the Tacoma Police Department was finally called and they reported Tika as missing. Police arrived to the scene pretty quickly. They began searching the surrounding area and they even blocked off the exit in the parking lot. Any vehicle that wanted to leave was thoroughly searched. They would check the back seat, the trunk, and you know, just made sure that Tika didn't accidentally climb into someone else's car or was taken. At first, they thought that maybe Tika had just wandered off on her own. Maybe she had gone outside and was going through the cars and accidentally climbed into someone else's. The reason they thought this is because the arcade was around six feet away from the building's exit. However, Teresa doesn't believe that her daughter would do this because as I mentioned earlier in the video, she loved being with her mom, she didn't like being with strangers, and she didn't like being alone. So it's not in Tika's character to just wander off. On top of that, the exit door was pretty heavy, so Teresa doesn't feel like a two-year-old little girl would be able to push that heavy door open by themselves. Of course, police wanted to check if the bowling alley had any security cameras that might have captured Tika's last movements, but unfortunately, the bowling alley didn't have any cameras. So police started to interview all 300 people that were at the bowling alley and some of these people were even interviewed twice. If people had a camera with them because they were taking pictures at night or recording home videos, police asked them to check their footage to see if maybe they captured Tika on camera or if maybe they captured anyone that might seem suspicious. Now as police were speaking to these witnesses, a woman came forward and told police that a maroon Pontiac Grand Am sped out of the parking lot around the same time Tika went missing. This car is described as a possibly four-door late 1980s or an early 1990s model with dark tinted windows and a large spoiler. Now this woman wasn't able to write down the license plate number or anything else that could help police track down this driver. So to this day, police aren't sure if this car is related to Tika's disappearance or if it was just a coincidence. However, I personally feel like it's strange. Like what are the odds that a car was quick peeling out of the parking lot the same moment that a two-year-old girl went missing. I feel like by now, if this driver had nothing to do with Tika's disappearance, I feel like they would have come forward and just told police that they were the driver. Police led an extensive 15-hour search for Tika, but unfortunately, they found nothing. Now, of course, police had to investigate Tika's family since a large percentage of child abductions are family-related. Tika's mother, Teresa, took two polygraph tests just to answer as many questions as possible, and she passed both of them. There were also witnesses that saw Teresa with her family the moment Tika disappeared. The other family members that were there when Tika disappeared also volunteered to take polygraph tests and the entire family was just very helpful. Tika's father, Robert, was actually incarcerated at the time so there's no way he could have abducted her. 
So within days of her disappearance, police were sure that this was a rare case of stranger abduction. Now, although Tika did not like to be picked up by strangers or by anyone that wasn't her mother, it's possible that if someone did abduct Tika and they did pick her up, she most likely screamed. But since there were over 300 people inside this bowling alley, it's possible that her screams were muted by the sound of the crowd. So I believe there were about 25 detectives working full time to solve Tika's case. Lots of tips poured in, but unfortunately, none of them led to Tika. However, three days after she disappeared, on January 26, two search dogs led police to some bushes across the street from the bowling alley. In these bushes, police found a pile of men's clothing pushed together to form a ball and stashed underneath the bush. None of these items had any mold on them, so this made police believe that these items hadn't been there for long. These items were described as a navy blue wool peacoat with IS or JS written on the back label, off-white Lee brand jeans, and a Columbia brand button-down plaid shirt. Again, police aren't sure if these items are related to Tika's disappearance or if they're just a coincidence. For weeks and months, hundreds of police and volunteers searched the woods and neighborhoods near the bowling alley trying to find any sign of Tika. TV stations, newspapers, and radio reports also talked about Tika's disappearance and encouraged people to be on the lookout. What we know at this point is about 10.30 Saturday evening, at the Frontier Bowling Lanes off of Center and Mullen here in Tacoma. Uh, a family was there bowling when they discovered their two-year-old daughter missing. We had uh, two off-duty police officers working there as security. Uh, the family notified the officers immediately. Uh, they did uh, seal the, the building off right away and started doing a check for the, for the two-year-old. Um, they went out to the parking lot and started checking the cars right away and basically contained the parking lot. Um, at this point, we have no new leads. The two-year-old, Tika, is still missing. We've initiated a search and rescue call out of our resources uh, that's going to be taking place this morning. And we're asking for the public to assist us in the fact that if you have any information about Tika, uh, please call 911 or please call the Tacoma Police Department. Police also questioned any registered sex offender in the area, and they also conducted a background check on all the bowling alley employees, but they came up empty-handed. As I mentioned, the news heavily covered Tika's disappearance, and this led to a handful of people coming forward and sharing their experiences at this bowling alley. On November 29th, 1999, just two months before Tika's disappearance, a man had attended a bowling league event with his four-year-old son at the New Frontier bowling lane. This man says that his son had gone to the bathroom and a couple of minutes later, someone walked in and saw his son lying on the bathroom floor. He had been sexually assaulted in the bathroom. Now, witnesses were able to describe the possible offender as a white man with curly brown hair, a beard, and possibly wearing a hat with the word husky on it. Of course, the dad reported this incident to the security at the bowling alley, and the security guard said that they've seen this man before, but they weren't sure what his name was. Now, for some reason, this incident was never reported to the police. It was only reported to the security guards at the bowling lane. Then, just weeks before Tika's disappearance, a family was spending their night at the bowling lane and their six-year-old son had been playing in the arcade the entire night. His mother was checking in on him while he was playing in the arcade and she would kind of go back and forth between the bowling lanes and the games. However, at one point when she looked up, she saw that a man was bending down near her son, holding his hand and talking to him. Of course, she immediately went over and approached the man and as she was getting closer to him, she overheard this man tell her son that he was his father, which of course was a lie. The mother confronted this man and she called security who escorted this man out of the building. Again, I don't believe this incident was reported to police. 
But I mean, what was going on at this bowling alley? Like, that is so scary, you guys. Like, the fact that you think that you would be safe at a bowling alley with your family, with so many kids around and other families around, but then this type of stuff is happening. It's just really frightening, and I don't understand how this was going on at the bowling alley, and nothing was done about it. They definitely should have reported these incidents to the police, or at least amped up their security. It's possible that these were all unrelated incidents, and maybe they're not the same guy. Now, there was another incident that occurred the same day Tika went missing. However, this didn't occur at the bowling alley. This occurred at a local park just a mile away. A father was at this park with his children when an unidentified male tried to abduct one of his kids. The dad chased this man away and he saw him get into a blue 1995 Pontiac Grand Am. Now, in the moment, he didn't report this incident to police. It wasn't until he saw the news about Tika's disappearance and made the connection that the man at the park could possibly be the same man at the bowling alley. And the fact that this man in the park got into a blue Pontiac Grand Am and the person seen peeling out of the parking lot when Tika disappeared also got into a Pontiac Grand Am, I just feel like it could possibly be the same man. So when the dad made the connection, he called the police and told them about what happened, but unfortunately, police have never been able to identify this man. And from there, police continued on with their investigation, but there really wasn't that much movement in her case. Tips would continue to come in, and her disappearance was still on the news. At one point, a tip came in from a neighbor saying, hey, Tika actually isn't missing. I literally see her in her front yard playing with her mom. So police headed over there, they investigated this tip, and it turned out not to be Tika. This was actually Tika's younger sister, Tamika, who looked very similar to Tika. So the neighbors were getting her confused. Now, there was a potential break in the case in 2001 when police found the body of an unidentified four-year-old girl. This young girl was found in St. Louis and police referred to her as a precious doe. They believed that this might be Tika, so they submitted her DNA to do a test. But when the results came back, it determined that this was not Tika. Precious Doe was later identified as Erica Michelle Marie Green, who was murdered by her mother and her stepfather. That in itself is just absolutely heartbreaking and I'm glad that she was able to be identified and hopefully laid to rest peacefully. In 2010, Teresa was hosting the annual vigil for her daughter when she received a tip from a man in his 40s. This man told her that he had visions of his daughter and she relayed this information to the police. She said there's a lot more to the story and she didn't really go into details about what his vision was, but the Tacoma Police Department did speak with this man and this led to them digging at the native garden at Point Defiance Park. It's not known what police were specifically looking for. All they said they were looking for was evidence. However, in the end, nothing was found. Of course, Tika's family was doing whatever they could to keep her name in the news. At one point, Teresa flew to New York to appear on the Montel Williams talk show. America's Most Wanted also did a reenactment of Tika's disappearance, and the Nancy Grace show also did a segment on her case. So there was a good amount of media coverage on Tika's case, which I think is amazing. Over the next several years, there were still extensive searches for Tika, as well as annual vigils to help bring awareness. On the anniversary of Tika's abduction, her loved ones gather for a candlelight vigil at the site where the bowling alley used to be. This location is actually now a Home Depot, but the family still meets there every single year. For Tika's birthday, which is on the 4th of July, her mother lights a special set of fireworks and wishes her daughter a happy birthday by releasing balloons into the sky. Her family even helped pass a new bill called Tika's Bill, which created a task force for missing and exploited children. Their hope is that through this task force, they will increase the effectiveness of a specific case by using the combined resources, knowledge, and technical expertise of the members of the task force. In 2019, the Washington State Patrol unveiled two 19-wheeler trucks with images of Tika on both sides. The pictures of Tika are what she looked like when she disappeared and what detectives believe she looks like now. They also put the phone number where you can call to report a missing child or to provide information about Tika's whereabouts. 
According to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, one out of six children are found due to the public seeing a picture of the child, which is why I think social media is a great tool. You never know who may come across that photo, so that's why it's so important to continue to share these photos. So these trucks were provided by Camway Transportation as part of Washington's Homeward Bound program, which is a program dedicated to finding missing children in the state of Washington. I love the idea of putting missing children's faces on these trailers because these trailers literally travel all over the place. So it's definitely a great way to bring awareness. Tika's mother has done a handful of interviews and press conferences talking about her daughter's disappearance. She said that Tika's bed is covered with Winnie the Pooh bears and she even bought all these special edition bears with each bear marking another holiday without her daughter. When Tika comes back, she doesn't want her daughter to feel as if she missed out on anything, which is why she buys all these bears. On one Christmas, Teresa felt certain that she would receive a call letting her know that Tika was found. So she she waited by the phone the entire day, but she never got a call. Later that night, she headed over to her mother's house to celebrate Christmas and she videotaped the entire night. As she was filming, she recorded the beautifully decorated house and told Tika, look, this is what Grammy's house looks like now. And she also showed Tika a tree that had some ribbons tied to them. She said that the ribbons were tied for every day that Tika has been gone. She told her that mommy misses her, loves her, and that wherever she's at, she hopes that the person that has her will give her the best Christmas ever, which honestly made me cry when I read that. I believe she records every holiday so that when Tika comes home, she can watch back the videos and see what she missed out on. Honestly, my heart breaks for Tika's family, especially for her mother. People are so cruel and said some terrible and nasty things to her when Tika first went missing. People were blaming her, calling her a bad mother because she turned away from her daughter. I mean, it was just brutal which I think is so wrong. I know I'm not a parent, but I've heard from other parents that it's pretty impossible to watch your child 24 seven. Like I said, Teresa literally glanced away for 10, 15 seconds just to see her brother bowl. And in that moment, something tragic happened. I really don't think people should be sending her hate. I feel like that's the last thing she needs right now. She literally lost her child and has been through so much. So I feel like Teresa and the rest of the family just needs as much love and support as possible. As for Tika's father, Robert, he's just as equally heartbroken. He said that on Tika's birthday and for the anniversary of her disappearance, he likes to be alone and talk to her. For the past years, he has held on to hope that his daughter would come back home. As I mentioned earlier in the video, he was incarcerated at the time Tika disappeared and he feels so guilty for that. He feels terrible that instead of being there for her and being at the bowling alley with her and watching over her, he was away serving time. He is completely heartbroken, but he remains hopeful that one day his daughter will come back home. To the people that have Tika, he wants to tell them that they shouldn't have taken her and that she's not theirs. He wants these people to know that Tika is loved and missed by her family and that she needs them. Tika went missing in 1999 and so many years went by without any serious movement in her case. It wasn't until two years ago in 2020 that there was finally some new movement. This is when a witness came forward and spoke with Q13 News about what he saw. This witness, who the news is calling John, was 17 at the time when him and his family were at the New Frontiers bowling lane. At one point during the night, John had to use the bathroom, so as he was walking over to the restroom, this rude guy bumped into him. This guy was white and had a little girl with him who appeared to be mixed. So John figured that this was the little girl's father and that he was just trying to rush his daughter into the bathroom. But he says that this moment stuck with him because the guy was just so rude. This guy just bumped into John and he didn't even apologize or say anything to him. So John just thought that this was like the rudest guy ever. After this, the rest of John's night went on and everything seemed pretty normal. It wasn't until his family was leaving the bowling alley when they realized that the parking lot was filled with police. They asked police why they were there, but they didn't reveal who or what they were looking for. However, a couple of days later, John was watching TV when he saw Tika's photo appear on the screen. This is when it clicked for him and he realized that the man that he had seen rushing to the bathroom with the little girl was Tika Lewis. 
and that that man was not her father. John immediately contacted the police and revealed this information to the police, and they did interview him, but they never contacted him after that, which he thought was strange. He literally gave them his phone number, his full name, his address, everything, and he expected to hear from them because he felt like his information was very big, but the police never did. We had gone to that bowling alley plenty of times, and it was kind of an area where People would kind of just come there with their families and kids can kind of roam. So I went towards where the restrooms were. This rude guy bumped into me with this little girl. And since he was white and Tico is mixed, or, you know, the little girl was mixed, I just thought it was the father just rushing his daughter to the bathroom. No one contacted me. I was easy to find. Maybe what I had to say just wasn't relevant. Um, or it wasn't useful. It wasn't until two decades later when a cold case detective named Steven was combing through Tika's case file and came across John's statement. As soon as he heard this testimony, he knew that this information was important. This witness actually describes a, a type of encounter with Tika um, by this individual. And the, the description of the individual is not generic, it's, it's specific and it's, and it's detailed. So of course, Detective Steven reaches out to John to see if he can still remember what this man looked like. And John says, yeah. John says he remembers this man's face perfectly. This man was white, about 5'11", and with a husky build. He had shoulder-length curly brown hair, a thick mustache, and a heavily pockmarked face. He was wearing a blue plaid shirt and faded jeans. A gentleman with pockmarks was holding this little girl's hand when he bumped into me. And I was thinking like, this is like the rudest person in the world. Again, this man was holding hands with Tika when he rudely bumped into John. Now, Detective Steven says that the pockmarks could be the key to identifying this man. This is because when he was going through Tika's file, he came across another witness statement that involved a pockmarked face. Now, remember when I said that America's Most Wanted had gone to the bowling alley to reenact Tika's disappearance? Well, while they were filming, there was a crowd standing outside watching the reenactment. During this, a person person noticed a man with a pockmarked face standing nearby also watching the reenactment. Now for some reason they thought that this man seemed suspicious and that's why they reported it to the police. About a week after um, Tika's disappearance uh, they were filming a reenactment down at the bowling alley and uh, someone who was standing there watching the reenactment noticed a person with a pockmarked face that was standing there. He was also watching the reenactment and uh, the witness who called in thought that he was acting strangely. This was back in 1999, so John still hadn't come out publicly describing what he saw. So there's no way that this witness would have known that a man with a pockmarked face had come up in the investigation. And you know, detectives say that the killers or offenders often go back to the crime scene. So I definitely think it's too weird to be a coincidence. Like, what are the odds that John saw a man with a pockmarked face in the bathroom the night Tika disappeared, and then this witness sees a man with a pockmarked face watching the reenactment of Tika's disappearance. I just feel like it's not a coincidence and police definitely need to find this man and thoroughly investigate him. When Detective Steven told Teresa about this new information, she says that it forced her to confront a horrific reality. She says, this man went in to find somebody, to find a child and harm that child. This man took my child, my everything. That was my world right there. That man went in there to find somebody, to find a child and harm that child. And that man took my child, my everything. That was my world right there. Detective Steven says that he gets his determination to keep going with the case because of Teresa. She has never given up after so many years. Teresa says that she's lived in this nightmare for so long and she's ready for it to come to an end. She just wants to bring her daughter home. Regardless if she's here or not, she just wants her home and for this nightmare to end. I mean, Tika has, you know, six nephews and three nieces that she's never met. She's got a baby sister she's never met. And 
that's all we wanted is for her to meet her family. But right now, we just want closure. Whatever happened to Tika, we just want to know. So there is an Instagram and Facebook page dedicated to finding Tika. I will make sure to link those down below so you guys can check them out and please go give them a follow. Her family is very active on those pages so it would be amazing if you guys could go comment and show them some support. I will also put a link down below for a flyer you can download, that way you can share it on social media. The Tacoma Police Department is still investigating the case and is asking for the public's help in identifying the man they believe may be connected to the disappearance of Tika. Again, this is a white man about 5'11 with a husky build and has shoulder length brown curly hair. He has a thick mustache and a heavily pockmarked face. They are also looking to find more information on the 80s or 90s Pontiac Grand Am that was seen peeling out of the parking light the night Tika disappeared. So two-year-old Tika Lewis had black hair with a silver streak on the right side, which is most visible when her hair is pulled back. She has curly hair, brown eyes, eczema with skin discoloration on her face, dimples, and pierced ears. She also has asthma, which may require medical attention. She was last seen wearing a green Tweety Bird t-shirt with white sweatpants, black and white Air Jordan sneakers, and a clear purse with a fish design on it. If you have any information about Tika's disappearance, please contact 1-800-222-TIPS or contact the Tacoma Police Department at 253-798-4721. There is a cash reward for any information leading to an arrest through Crime Stoppers, so please contact them at 253 253- 5915959. My thoughts and prayers go out to Tika's family. I truly hope that she is found soon and can be reunited with her family. I pray that this man is identified and can lead to some type of answer and closure soon. But all right, you guys, that's pretty much all the information I have for today's video. If there are any updates in Tika's disappearance, I will let you guys know by putting it in a pinned comment down below. Again, if you guys could please share her flyer on social media or share it with people that you know from Washington. That would be amazing just so we can help spread as much awareness as possible. But yeah, I would love to know what you guys think about this down below and if there's ever any other cases you guys would like me to cover, make sure to submit it through my case suggestion form that's always in the description box down below. I have a general request form and I also have a family request form. I know sometimes people submit them through Instagram DM and I try to go through all of my DMs as much as I can, but sometimes they're just frozen. I don't know what's wrong with my Instagram, so if I take a while to respond back, that's why it's not because I'm avoiding you. But anyways, that's pretty much all I have to say for today's video. Thank you guys so much for being here and listening to Tika's story. Don't forget to subscribe before you guys leave, and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye guys!